Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Taming and Securing the Internet of Things Infestation in Your Enterprise, sponsored by Great Bay Networks. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are John Pescatori, SANS Director of Emerging Security Trends, and Ty Powers, Technical Product Manager at Great Bay Software. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to John. Okay, thanks Carol and welcome everyone. Uh, give you an idea of what we're going to talk about here today. Certainly the Internet of Things has been talked about for a long time, but has recently been in the news as we saw things like the Mirai uh, botnet attacks take advantage of compromised things out there and cause damage to businesses. And I think it's a great topic to be drilling down on today. Let me give an idea of what we'll go through. I'll open things off uh, with sort of an overview, a definition, and a, and a drill down into uh, what the Internet of Things means and sort of lay the groundwork for the important considerations in uh, uh, minimizing the impacts IoT devices, attacks, and threats might have on your business. Um, then I'm going to turn things over to Ty Powers from Great Bay, and he'll give a great drill down into uh, so the particular uh, good methodology for gaining visibility and control of devices that might be on your network and uh, capabilities of their tools and products in, in helping you get everything under control. We will save time at the end for questions, as Carol mentioned, but also as we're going along, if you want to enter questions in that window on the right-hand side, um, either when I'm speaking or when Ty's speaking, I'll be trying to monitor that. We might be able to get to some of, them, some of them as we go along. If you're watching a recorded version of this webinar, at the end we'll give you an email address where you can send your questions to, and uh, we'll get you answers later on. So with that, let's get going. So I always like to start with what the financial people are using to define any new trend or technology. And back in 2010, this definition of the Internet of Things came about that I think really captures it. It's basically if every thing out in the world that produced information could communicate with everything that needed to consume information or could be more effective if it consumed information, um, a lot of money would flow in that direction. So, you know, bottom line is sensors, things that can produce information, um, feeding actuators, things that can make decisions um, based on that information and change other things are what's driving the Internet of Things. You know, it used to be the people were the only actuators, but now your automobile might be an actuator, your VCR, your video camera, etc. cetera. Um, but it's not just the number of devices out there and the complexity or, or risk of all those devices. Since all those sensors are creating data, um, there's a lot of new data produced and flying around and being stored somewhere. So, so there's a data security issue. Now, a lot of it might be innocuous data, you know, Fitbit information. Well, you know, Fitbit information of where I physically am can be of pretty useful uh, information to thieves if it proves that I'm not at my house when they want to rob my house and, and ditto vehicles that are delivering packages and so on. So there's also this uh, data threat problem that, that gets exacerbated by all these new sources and places uh, this information has to be stored. And then the whole goal of a lot of this Internet of Things is to lead to machine-to-machine -machine communications and more automation, whether it's smart grids or uh, autonomous vehicles and delivery systems or environmental sensors and the like. Of course, that opens up uh, lots of both malicious attack possibilities, but also accidental problems caused by software problems that can not only automate good things, but auto automate errors and bad things that in security we have to worry about from availability perspective as well. So the bottom line is uh, I think this, is a, this captures um, sort of the underlying promise of the Internet of Things. And when you start looking at sort of the adoption or growth in connected things, uh, it's already happened. So this is something Greylock pulled together. If you look at the lowest pink curve, that's how long in, in quarters 
uh, you know, three year, three month chunks. How long it took the original AOL desktop client, remember all those CD-ROMs, to reach in, in this case a 10 million level. It took it 19 quarters, and then you move up to the light blue curve. I'm, I'm skipping the mobile internet curve. Move up to the light blue curve. That was Netscape and a much better browser for a way of attracting the web. It took that about 17 quarters to reach 50 million, and then that greenish curve uh, took the iPhone less than uh, about two years, about eight quarters, to reach 57 million. Um, people and when you started trying to count the things with IP addresses uh, on the internet that weren't PCs, phones, or, or browsers uh, or servers, um, the the internet of things soared through the hundred million mark within three less than a year. And as nobody even knows how many are out there anymore, um, uh, connected things. So bottom line is that it's been rapid penetration because that value is there. You know, we all know it from our daily lives. The number of things we're using connected. One way you can easily tell is if you ever update your Wi-Fi router at your house, how many uh, new passwords you have to stick into things. I have something like, I think it was 19 things now in my house connected, and I'm not a high-tech person at all on that side of things. And because I'd like to sort of take a very simple view of the Internet of Things from the point of view of business and cybersecurity. So, you know, sort of the first wave was the standard computing type devices like PCs and servers and later on routers and switches and things like VMware and the like. These were computing capabilities bought by IT and managed by IT. And then the security group would work with IT to secure those things. This seemed hard enough when we were dealing with that. Um, and you can date that back to the start of the PC, say in the early 80s and so on. Well, really, about 10 years later, we didn't notice it at the time, but in the sort of mid-90s, the operations people and the manufacturing people and the business units, they were buying things with computers in them, um, but they weren't buying them as computers, so often IT and IT security wasn't involved. And we started calling that operational technology, with ICS and SCADA devices being the poster child and, and medical machinery and the healthcare world being a very key ATM machines and the like. And that certainly expanded over the years into pretty much every industry having something with Windows or Linux embedded operating systems in it that are connected to networks and are performing business functions and at some point in time get thrown over the transom to IT. Now in the early days the, we said these are not connected to anything. Well of course they were. They needed software updates so they had if nothing else sneaker net connections uh, but then very quickly um, they all have internet connectivity or Bluetooth connectivity that gets them internet connectivity. So this OTIT integration has been a, uh, a heavy-duty topic here for just about 10 years. But then there was another wave when users began to buy computers they could carry around in their hand, smartphones and iPads and tablets and the like, and then demand that they get to use those at work regardless of how long it was taking the IT organization to decide we should move from Blackberries to sort dumb cell phones to smartphones or even think about tablets. Now, of course, more tablets are bought than PCs. Um, now, this we called BYOD, bring your own device, and we started to think about uh, the need to how can we get visibility and control back in when employee-owned devices were being used. Uh, but, of course, it didn't stop there. So the consumer market, we now had so this phase of personal, first phase of personal technology was employees buying computers and then IT having to uh, manage the use of those computers and IT security having to figure out a way to secure the use of those employee-owned devices. Now, of course, customers uh, and just about everywhere else are, are buying devices that have software and communications capability been, built into them that are pretty much used everywhere. And it's by no means an exhaustive example there, but again, the, the Mirai botnet example was home entertainment DVR type systems with vulnerable, essentially Linux operating systems running in them that were compromised and used to launch denial of service attacks and the like. Um, and everything on this chart is uh, able to be used for that, that same type capability. So bottom line is almost every business either has Internet of Things devices in use as part of its delivery of its business, and certainly our customers um, are widely using them, and our employees are widely using all of these devices um, that add up to things we need to think about how we're going to protect.
Now, before joining SANS in 2013, I spent almost 14 years at Gardner. One of my favorite things were hype cycles, which you see one here for latest Gardner hype cycle for the Internet of Things. And a short way to look at hype cycles for you, if you're not familiar, on the far left, you see the innovation trigger. That's when some new technology first comes along and it flies up and at some point is at the peak of overinflated expectations, where it's going to be penicillin and solve all the world's problems quickly drops into the trough of disillusionment when uh, all the problems of making it work come about and then uh, things that uh, have value work their way out to that plateau of productivity on the far right. A shortcut, it's interesting to see uh, if you look right in the plateau or the trough of disillusionment, you see smart lighting. I think thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have bought 16 to $24 light bulbs with IP addresses and said, why, why do I need this? Anyway. Um, a quick shortcut for thinking of looking at a hype cycle to help you make decisions. Think of it as a teeter-totter, sort of balanced on the trough of disillusionment. If there's a lot of weight on the right hand, left-hand side, if you see more dots on the left-hand side, then it's a very immature area. If there's lots of dots on the right-hand side, it's a mature area. Obviously, Internet of Things is an immature area. I put the little red arrow up here. You can see where system security is. It's just about approaching the peak of overinflated expectations. And you look at other things like IoT services or platforms or architecture or management, all very immature disciplines and more scattered. Now one thing, uh, Gardner doesn't do it anymore. I used to do a thing called the threat hype cycle where I used to show any new technology and this innovation phase, the first thing we see is denial of service attacks against it. In the early days of the internet, um, DDoS was very common and uh, even in mobile, you think of every new technology came along, Mirai is a good example of DDoS attacks uh, uh, hitting the internet of things. After that, usually come, uh, and, and it, DDoS attacks are first because it allows experimenters and college kids and other people just playing around to easily try to break the technology. After that, we usually see Cybercrime, fi financially motivated attacks, using the same vulnerabilities that the experimenters use to crash things, see if uh, they can steal information, lead to identity theft or, or ransomware or do uh, ransom for uh, denial of service attacks. So usually the second phase is cyber criminals, the third phase is generally nation states. Now in the Internet of Things, if you drill down into the critical infrastructure and SCADA systems, ICS and the like, uh, we've seen nation states attacking nuclear power plants and uh, electrical power plants and the like. So we saw the nation states actually move in earlier on the Internet of Things than we've seen in previous, uh, previous generations of new technology. But we're right at this point where we've sort of gone past the phase of denial of service attacks against the broader Internet of Things, and we'll start to see those cybercrime oriented attacks and additional nation state attacks start coming. So it's sort of a, and oh, here's some data. One of my jobs at SANS is to look at every different threat and data report that comes out there and sort of highlight things periodically. Here's one that came out of Hackmageddon, uh, looking at the top 10 attack techniques over the past three years. And if you go past unknown and account hijacking and targeted attacks at the top, uh, you see DDoS attacks um, actually have grown the fastest here for several years. Um, and are seeing a strong growth. This is partially fueled by uh, the Internet, Internet of Things. Mirai was just one example of that. Uh, but it's also fueled by ransomware um, attacks now being more and more common as well. But definitely you can see we've already started that phase. So we start trying to drill down and start thinking about what it means to uh, for us to secure our business from the Internet of Things or secure business use of things. It's important to think about the differences. And here I've listed what I think are the most important ones on the chart. Yeah, you know, we grew up in IT and IT security dealing with Windows and Unix and Linux as general purpose operating systems by a small number of vendors. Didn't seem that small when there was three or four of them, but uh, now the embedded operating systems are I mean, the Internet of Things operating systems are embedded into a, a single purpose or limited purpose device, and they're also heterogeneous. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of different flavors of operating systems and, and Linux variants and embedded windows and other things in use. And, and the same phone in two different years has a different version of everything. The same washing machine or DVR, different version of things. Um, the the uh, things we needed to uh, secure 
used to be sitting in one place on wired networks. Obviously now the Internet of Things is mobile. Used to be a relatively small set of standards and pretty mature standards when you think about TCP IP and HTML and 802.11 on the wireless side. When you look on the Internet, I mean on the Internet of Things side, there's a long range of wireless standards, IoT standards. It's industry by industry. It's not mature at all. Um, Applications are used to layering on top of a general purpose operating system. Now they're embedded and often intertwined with the operating system in ways we learned in the Windows world is generally not a good thing for security. Things are definitely more consumer driven and that means in many cases shorter life cycles, sort of fad driven uh, life cycles for technology, but also means in this world of implanted devices or uh, environmental sensors or things in uh, deeply buried into uh, uh, automobiles and fleets and the like, we might have some things that have to have 20 year life cycles. I think the most important part to think about is we're still dealing with the impact of threats today that are on data breaches primarily or blocking access or denying access to data for denial of service. When we start looking at a lot of uses of the Internet of Things, we're talking about impact to health and safety. Power plants are one example. Think about autonomous cars, delivery drones, uh, aircraft systems. We're talking about uh, even just denial of service attacks that can lead to impact on health and safety, not just the cost of dealing with a breach. And that's very key to think about. So we start thinking about how do we secure things against attacks. We want to look at the attacks that are out there and what vulnerabilities really are in the technologies. And we have to focus on the highest payback areas first. Otherwise, we repeat the mistakes we made in the sort of the Windows software world and the Internet software world, and we never get anything secured. Uh, we got to look at what's actually in use and works and can be automated. And once we can uh, get started, then given time and budget, we can move on to sort of higher levels. This is essentially the approach that the critical security controls um, have taken. And that's where I'm going to focus and drill down here a bit in a second, and, and then we'll drill down into the very key areas, and I'll hand things over to Ty. did have a question come in, said standards are industry by industry. Um, there's been a lot of debate about IoT standardization as an umbrella topic. I'll give you my opinion. There's, there's multiple Internet of Things standards in consumer electronics. There's multiple in the automotive industry. Um, there's multiple uh, definitions in different areas of the federal government and the DOD. Um, so I don't think there, for two things, I don't think there's anything meaningful where we could say, oh, everything should be like this across the Internet of Things. What you do in a car is going to be very different than what you do in a Fitbit in order to uh, secure things. There's no way one size is going to fit all for every various type of device and their use and their criticality and, and so on anyway. Um, but even given that, within vertical industries, within similar use cases, like within vehicles and the like, there's um, multiple competing standard def efforts. We're in the early days of all this. So when we look at the critical security controls as sort of a, a baseline set of prioritized types of uh, security controls, I'm not going to spend much time going through these. I think probably most of the SANS communities uh, pretty familiar with the controls, but they're numbered in order, sort of priority order, and the first four or five are the basic security hygiene of knowing what's on your network, how it's configured, and is it vulnerable, and then you start moving up into the higher level things of ways to protect against malware and limit connectivity and recover data and so on. Um, we spend a lot of time, it's now um, under the um, auspices of the Center for Internet Security, SANS has been supporting it for many years, and many proven case studies of, of successfully using it as an approach to uh, secure both existing operations and new technologies and, and new operations. So when you look at across those controls, there's I think these four groupings of the controls are very critical to thinking through how you're going to extend your security operations and processes and controls out to things like in the Internet of Things. One is how will these things connect to my enterprise and how will they be governed? Um, that's, a, that's a lot of process and sort of uh, governance risk compliance type decision making to think about uh, and define, for instance, uh, ITOT integration. Things that used to be managed by the manufacturing side or not managed at all, now tossed over the transom to IT. Um, the, the governance model for things on the manufacturing floor within the, the power plant is changing um, and needs to be integrated into the connectivity and governance model uh, we've been using first for corporate-owned PCs and servers and later on employee-owned devices. Really critical to every phase of new technology is that visibility. Again, back to the basic security hygiene of 
what's on my network, what is what do I actually own and control, what do I not own and control, is it vulnerable, is it dangerous, what do I do about it? Then get to those higher level things, similar things about how do I limit the attack aperture, how do I detect attacks that I couldn't stop faster, how do I more quickly recover? But really, uh, the purpose here for this webinar is to focus uh, on that visibility and control side of things. So when we sort of, get, let me lay out the bottom line, and we're going to do a little poll question here. We learned in the BYOD wave, uh, we, learned, we learned in every wave of technology, but certainly the BYOD wave uh, pointed it out just a few years ago. Um, if, it's gonna, if employees want to use it for a business purpose, it will get used. If we don't pretend it's not there, it will get used badly, it will get compromised, it will cause problems. Uh, whether it was PCs, tablets, Wi-Fi connected printers, all the other stuff that came on the network. If you can't see it, you can't secure it. Once we can see it, we have to know what it is, know if it ours, profile it, understand how much connectivity we should give it, what, what should we limit. And that's what we basically started to do with network hygiene and, and network access control in the BYOD world. What I've seen is the most successful starting point for those companies that are already having to extend security out to the Internet of Things has to been to build on the approach they did use for BYOD, for iPhones and iPads and Android phones and you know the whole employee-owned stuff. Um, longer term, it's important to get involved in the procurement phase so that we're getting security requirements baked in when the business side is going out to choose devices or controllers or kiosks or ATM machines or whatever. But for now, we got to focus on dealing with these pop-up things just like we did for BYOD. So we want to bring up a survey question here. Since network access control, uh, Carol, if you can bring up the uh, survey question, um, the question, the poll. Um, since network access control was very key to our ability to notice when something connected to the network, uh, to determine what kind of device it was, uh, and then to determine whether it was one of ours, was it managed, should I give it full access? Um, Carol, can you bring the poll question up onto the screen? There we go. Uh, we want to give uh, Ty a baseline. What percentage of you out there have already got going in network access control? While you're entering it in, back in the, boy, this was in the early 2000s, I sort of kicked off the Gartner coverage of net, what we ended up calling network access control, which sort of split the difference between what uh, Microsoft was, was calling network admission control and what SANS, or, uh, Cisco was calling something slightly different. And we ended up with network access control as uh, the, the uh, title. And I saw it be used, uh, be overpromised. It went through a hype cycle where it was uh, the peak of overinflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment. But it did emerge as a very useful technique. And it is something baked into the critical security controls. So when we look, we got about 46% of you have a NAC uh, solution looking to improve it. And about... Uh, Wow, 10% of you have perfect next solutions. We're, we're going to take down your email addresses and we'll, we'll all send you resumes so we can go work for you guys. 25% don't deploy a next solution and don't plan to. I think when you start looking at how you're going to deal with the Internet of Things, you might call it something different, but the ability to detect when something connects to your network, to decide what it is and to essentially profile it and apply a security policy is critical. Um, and, and whether we call it NAC or something else, uh, we'll, we'll see this is going to be very key for uh, sort of maintaining the balance of risk as we do move into this broader Internet of Things generation. So with that, uh, Carol, we bring back the presentation, and I'm going to turn it back over, turn it over to Ty uh, Power from Great Bay for some drill down. Uh, thanks, John, and thank you, everybody, for your time today. So what we'll do is um, I'm not going to kill you guys with PowerPoint, but there are a few things that I want to cover, and then at the end of it, we'll actually do a little bit of a uh, screenshot walkthrough um, on some of the things that we're able to do to you know, potentially help you guys out. So as, the, as part of the agenda, we're going to start with um, really starting with the end in mind, um, really what it is that we're trying to accomplish and how we need to go about accomplishing it. Um, and moving on to things like you know, not on my network, um, a behavioral side of things, if it looks like a breach and sounds like a breach, well, then it may very well be a breach. Um, the devil's in the data, you know, making sure that you're getting down to the level of granularity that's required or desired. And then a rising, excuse me, rising water floats all boats. Um, and then we'll top it off with the, uh, that teaser demo and the screenshot walkthrough. So John already gave us a wealth of information about IoT. Um, and if we look at, you know, the reasons behind a lot of the vulnerabilities that are out there, you know, they're, they're plentiful. Um, it really, at the, at the precipice of it is, 
Um, manufacturers are trying to be first to market. They're trying to get devices out there. They're trying to get them out to the marketplace and essentially make a business for themselves. So the focus is on you know, timeliness to market and the focus on um, the task at hand, what those devices are supposed to do, with a little bit less focus uh, on the security side. Um, and it's, in some cases, it's not just a, um, a lack of focus on that side, but there is a, you know, a certain amount of um, lack of ability on some of those devices. They're built off of some you know, older operating systems in a lot of cases, or built off of you know, maybe uh, uh, whether it's limitations in the IP stack or the IP um, or the operating system, there's reasons that those devices may not be, uh, may not be able to even become more secure. There's a, there's a certain number of resource constraints. Um, there's obviously limited uh, or no patching capabilities in a, lot of, in a lot of cases. If you look at things like the Mirai botnet, you know, there were a number of different reasons that that attack became so, uh, so prevalent. You know, one of the reasons was their use of um, uh, default credentials, uh, credentials that were out there and readily available through a couple of Google searches. Uh, but they weren't hardened or they weren't shut off in any way. But in some cases, the devices themselves weren't able to be updated as well. Um, some of that's changed since those attacks. But you know, these are just some high-level reasons that you know we're in sort of sort of the state that we're in on top of on top of the sheer volume of devices hitting the marketplace. So starting with the uh, you know keeping an eye on the end in mind, the first step is really understanding the problem that we're trying to solve. If we don't understand where we're headed or where we want to get to, we'll never know if we're there. <clears throat> so it's really understanding the, the problem at hand. And if, if you think about a lot, of, a lot of the things that were driving the adoption of systems like NAC, you know, it may be you know, an audit finding. You know, if somebody comes in and looks, or uh, an auditor comes in and either does a scan or just you know, does some other methods of understanding whether or not there are open ports, or even if you just look at a lot of the regulatory compliances out there, they start with uh, the requirement of understanding what's on the network. Um, those things don't necessarily equate to deploying a NAC system. So it's really understanding you know, what it is that you're trying to accomplish or what problem that you're trying to solve and making sure that you choose a solution accordingly. Um, you know, beyond, the tr beyond the choosing of a solution, we also have to keep a number of other things in mind. Things along the lines of creating, you know, creating things like cross-functional teams. So putting the people and the processes in place as well to make sure that Again, the goal, um, the goal that we're trying to achieve are met. Um, Cross-functional cross teams are critical because IoT has, uh, has become you know, just that. It crosses all those traditional boundaries like John had alluded to. You know, the IT and the OT worlds are um, those lines that were very, uh, very prevalent in the past are becoming more and more blurred. So we need to make sure that we're you know, creating teams to um, to understand both sides of uh, those worlds to the depth that we need to. Um, there's a number of policies and procedures that we need to make sure that we put in place too around things like new device adoption. So understanding you know, really what you're getting into before you adopt some of those technologies is going to be critical in making sure that you, know, you, re you remain safe, uh, safe and protected. Excuse me. Um, deploying things like minimum security baselines so that as these new technologies and new products are adopted, you know, there's guidelines in place as to how they should be deployed, how they should be conf uh, configured, so that there's no ambiguity around just plugging things into the network and seeing if they can communicate. Um, and then there's a number of other things, such as creating testing and governance to make sure that the things that you uh, are deploying and those policies and procedures that you put in place are actually working and that they're being followed. Um, and the last piece is really, you know, we need to make sure that we're, that we're continuing to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. When we look at things like the Mirai botnet, there's, uh, there are things that we can always do to make sure that we're not um, you know, participating, that we're not essentially becoming part of that. And our devices can't be compromised in a way that they're um, employed in such an attack. So you know, limiting things like um, internet-facing connectivity where possible, which is a little bit of a conundrum since a lot of these devices are, are built that way, and that's why we're using them. But making sure that we're following all the other um, things that we could do to make sure that, again, we're not propagating the problem, but we're, in fact, uh, becoming part of the solution. So the next thing is really focusing very much on visibility. So, you know, knowing what's on your network at all times. You know, if you can answer the following questions of, 
you know, what's on my network, how long has it been there, has it moved? Has it moved can be a critical one. You know, for a lot of these devices, they're wireless, which means that mobility is, you know, is baked right in and, and movement is, is very natural. But there are devices that fit the bill that are, that are still wired in connectivity um, and should never move. And if they move, you need to know about it in real time. And on top of that, you need to understand if these devices are in fact yours. So there's an ownership aspect of it as well. You know, as we start to look at you know, augmenting systems or deploying systems to provide us with this enhanced level of visibility, we need to make sure that we're complementing our existing uh, existing systems, making sure that we're that we're truly augmenting things like if we've already deployed a NAC system or really any other security system. You know, there's there's visibility. And then there's the ability to provide visibility that that breaks down or bridges those information silos. You know, we're always deploying point products because we, you know, we essentially have to. There's a problem and we need to solve it. And in a lot of cases, we're moving very quickly. Um, but in some cases, we need to take a step back and pay attention to what it is that we're doing. And again, making sure that we're leveraging existing investments or previous investments to essentially get to the same end result. So the next piece is really focusing very much on behavior. It's of paramount importance that we understand you know, how endpoints on our network are behaving. And, and essentially, there's you know, really three main categories of behavior. There's good or expected behavior. There's certainly bad, malicious, or uncharacteristic behavior. And then there's, there's this threshold that good or expected behavior goes beyond and becomes a bit suspect or becomes potentially malicious. If you think about a device, you know, if you think about the, uh, the standard computing days, you know, devices do things like send email. Well, if they're compromised, that email uh, behavior can increase exponentially. And, and that, that holds true for a number of other things as well. Even if you're talking about uh, market-specific devices like PLCs, you know, those devices are going to communicate in a very expected way. And if they behave a little bit differently or maybe beyond that threshold, could be indicative of a, of a serious problem at hand. It might be that the device has been compromised. Uh, it could just be that the device is failing. But in either case, you need to know about it and essentially take action. Now, if, if we have this understanding about behavior and we're able to monitor it, we can leverage that behavior in, in really two ways. We can use it to leverage um, and, and use it to understand expected behavior so that we essentially increase trust in that device. Well, if a printer prints or things that are communicating with that printer are communicating over common printer ports, well, then we're pretty sure that it's that type of device. But if it starts to behave differently, again, we need to know about it in real time because any changes in behavior could be, um, could be indicative of a real problem. The next step here is really talking about really a very rich, deep understanding about what these endpoints are. You know, there's, there's Device discovery, but that's not nearly enough. You know, real-time device discovery is critical because of its timeliness, but you've got to take it to a much more granular level. You need a real-time, uh, rich, contextual, and historical understanding about these endpoints. Um, you need to have the ability to bind both identity and behavioral attributes to those devices for, you know, essentially an increased level of trust. If you know that um, a device is this type of device because its identity, it, you know, it looks like that type of device and it behaves like that type of device, well, then you've got a, certainly an increased level of trust. And really the model here is, is focusing on the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, there's a lot of different attributes out there, but it's really a matter of finding a system like Beacon that can combine all of these attributes in a warehouse of context to give you that, that very deep, rich, contextual understanding about that endpoint. The, uh, the bottom part of the slide is really talking about you know, this notion of um, max boot detection. If you can truly identify devices based on those identity and behavioral attributes, you can very easily identify potentially max boot scenarios. So if you think about you know, these IoT devices in the enterprise, you know, if we're already authenticating, then you know, chances are that we've got to trust those devices based on some, you know, some simple data, you know, MAC address, MAC vendor data. Um, that alone isn't enough. You know, our ability to actually combine, you know, those very simple attributes with the deeper identity attributes and behavior 
gives us the ability to detect you know, those max spoof attempts and essentially give you the ability to take back control over the network. The last piece really, you know, the, the rising water floats all boats, um, really is, is focused on this notion of execution. You've got to act. This, um, you know, the, the immaturity of the IoT landscape, you know, definitely plays a significant role here. But the bottom line is that we can't wait for, you know, all the regulation. We can't wait for all of these things to um, essentially work themselves out. Um, you've got to act now and you've got to find systems that can, you know, start to close the gaps. Um, here's where we have to very much pay attention to things like making sure that we're choosing the right solution and not just, not just picking a point product. You've got to make sure that you're choosing solutions that can provide you the level of visibility that you need that are highly scalable systems that are going to mature with the organization. Um, systems that can continue to grow with you that aren't going to become obsolete. You know, if you think about NAC, and, and John had mentioned it a while back, they're, they're very sound systems. But as some of you noted in the poll, you know, there, there are clearly areas where they can be um, enhanced greatly. So it's finding those systems and making sure that you know, the integration points are there and that you're, you're able to kind of bridge those gaps. Um, again, we've got to make sure that we're avoiding you know, creating any of those additional data silos. You know, information is plentiful on our networks, but we need to make sure that it's usable. And the more, the more that we silo that data, the more difficult it is for us to use it. And I think another piece here that's worth mentioning is, you know, as you continue to look to enhance the systems that you've already invested in, you've got to make sure that you're choosing vendors and integrators that, that provide the same level of service that, you know, you hold yourselves to, but also maybe the same level of service that, you know, that you're providing to your customers depending on, depending on the markets that you're in. You know, those are very critical things that fall deep outside or well outside the technology. Um, and, you know, for some of you that don't have NAC, you know, you've got to you've got to look at this in a very pragmatic way. You've got to look at it and, and understand again what is it the, the problem that you're trying to solve? Is it something that can be solved by visibility alone, um, or is it something that you need to look at maybe a NAC system with something that has um, you know maybe greater visibility by combining multiple systems and creating a best in breed solution? You know, for those of you that have no plans at all on deploying NAC, you know, increased visibility is still uh, you know is still critical. You know, when we when we talk about NAC, it's there's an enforcement mechanism, but there's there's a visibility component. And if you try and deploy any flavor of enforcement on top of uh, flawed or um, incomplete visibility, you're destined to fail. So the the last couple of slides here, I really just kind of want to walk through a couple of um, a couple of scenarios in regards to things that we that we can do to you know to help. So this slide here, we're just, you know, we're really showing you a couple of things, but um, really what we're providing is intelligent Mac-based authentication with the optional automated response based on things like identity or behavioral changes. So in this regard, if you look at the top portion of the slide, you've got this pie chart, which really is a kind of a visual of, you know, what's on the infrastructure based on device type. So this screenshot came from um, a demo environment where we had a number of medical devices. So you see things like Stryker, uh, Stryker iPad monitors. But the gist of it here is that in this case, if you look to the right, we've identified this Apple device, um, but it's ended up in a profile called uh, bad endpoint. And it's done that because of behavior or specific behavioral change. And if you look at the bottom part of the screen there, that's actually a view of the, of the switch CLI. So you can see that um, the, the authorization essentially failed once Beacon dynamically changed that device's profile because, because of that behavioral change or that behavior detection. So being able to identify these devices and monitor for you know, any change in either identity or behavior is, is something that can very much augment any NAC system. As we, as we look to adopt you know, the plethora of IoT devices out there, We've got to make sure that we've got real-time discovery of all devices. Um, and obviously, we've already touched on the fact that it's got to go deeper beyond real-time discovery, but real-time discovery is the first portion of it. You've got to be able to identify devices as quickly as possible as they're entering the infrastructure, whether they're on authenticating ports or not. You know, if they're on authenticating ports, there's a certain level, there's a certain level of uh, expectation around um, whether or not that device would gain access. 
Um, but on an unauthenticating port, in, in a lot of cases, if you're talking about things like industrial control environments, you know, there's chances are very good that a lot of those ports aren't subjected to 802.1x or NAC. So devices can essentially get plugged in all the time. Being able to identify these devices and know critical components, critical uh, pieces of information about those devices in real time is critical. So if you look at the, the top part here with the, with the line graph, you know, this is just a, an event viewer that's available on the home page to show you a quick snapshot of new endpoints that are showing up, uh, things that are changing profile, um, and maybe even things where we've identified duplicate Macs. So we've seen a Mac address on this port, um, as well as that same Mac address on another port. That can be indicative of a problem. Below that, you see that an event is fired. Um, the event was all new endpoints, and the event or that endpoint matched this rogue device profile. That event fired because if you look further to the right, you can see that we've we've gathered up some additional data about that endpoint. So we've got this device by MAC address, by MAC vendor, by IP address. We know when it was discovered, when's the last time we saw data, but we know exactly where it is. That's critical. You can't just know that something new showed up. You've got to know exactly where it is. Because if it does require any manual intervention, or if you want to actually you know, understand whether or not something should have been plugged in, you've got to know where. And then if you look further on down, this is just a, a deeper view of the, of the endpoint summary of that device. In this case, I just took a quick snapshot of some of the DHCP data that was that was associated with that device in real time. So I get host name, I have a vendor class, I can even look at things like DHCP options and requested options. Um, one of the things that I didn't capture in this screenshot would be, you know, the notion of behavior. So if Beacon was getting the information from that part that part of the network, we would actually see things like traffic data or open port data. So again, that data could be used to either trust the device or um, it could also be used to identify where a device might have a problem or not. The next piece is really around rogue endpoint detection. Obviously, if you have the ability to detect everything in real time, well, then you should certainly have the ability to detect rogue endpoints. Um, it's interesting, so a lot of times when I start to talk about rogue endpoints, the conversation quickly unfolds into rogue access points, but really rogue devices go much deeper beyond rogue access points. You know, rogue APs have been a problem for a very long time. Rogue AP detection has been built into wireless systems for, you know, for a very long time. But really, a rogue endpoint could, be, could mean a number of other things. It could be something that was maybe misconfigured. Maybe it was the detection of, um, in this case, something that matched what we're calling a non-compliant profile or potential rogue based on some very simple information like you know, any of these consumer-grade Mac vendors should never show up in my infrastructure. So if you see Cisco, Linksys, D-Link, Belkin, you know, any of those types of players where, that you can pick up at your local Best Buy or any electronics store, you know, it's very easy for us to identify those things in real time. You may not want to shut the port off, but you certainly want to know when they show up. In this case, I had an event called New Rogue, um, and there's a number of different uh, logic points that we, can, that we can use to trigger that. In this case, it was a new endpoint showing up in the infrastructure that matches that profile. And that profile, again, was based on a number of things, including those, uh, those Mac vendors. You know, all these consumer-grade devices, I want to know about them in real time. Um, if you look a little further down, you've got a variety of event delivery methods. You know, obviously, Beacon has the ability to detect that. We can show it in the Beacon interface. But you, know, you may want us to send that to an existing SIM. So maybe you enable syslog. We could send it out there to you know, any of the SIM vendors that are taking in syslog feeds. Um, maybe you want us to send an SNMP trap to your NMS for alerting purposes. Um, a lot of our customers are already using you know, a variety of different enterprise class network management systems, and they're already, you know, they've already configured all sorts of email alerts. So they've said, well, send a trap over to that system because my teams are already getting emails. Um, so we're able to very much piggy piggyback along those, um, those same methods as well. But then you have the ability to actually have Beacon participate in the remediation. So if you look further on down there, the active response here, we have the ability to take action against the detection of that rogue. So the two options are enabling change of authorization or SNMP. So for change of authorization, uh, and actually SNMP both, we can do things like instruct the switch to uh, reauthorize that session or try to reauthorize it. Um, we can actually be a little bit more heavy handed and instruct the switch to either uh, bounce the port or you know shut the port off altogether. So depending on 
uh, where you're deploying something like Beacon and the level of granularity and enforcement that you're looking for, you know, you can pick and choose how heavy-handed you want to be. So really this gives us the real-time event detection, real-time endpoint detection with location data, which is critical. Again, location by switch name, switch IP, and port. The event delivery methods we already covered being syslog and SNMP, and then the active response options. Again, those are options. You don't have to have Beacon uh, reach out and do anything. It could just be alerting. So in regards to the max spoof detection and prevention, on the top here is another event that fired. So you can see this one was based on a profile change. The event name was max spoof attempt. It's critical severity. You know exactly when that's fired. You've got the MAC address and MAC vendor, the IP address of the device, the profile that the device resided in first, and what it's moved to based on the behavioral change or identity change, and we still have that location data. So in this case, we have a Lexmark printer that was on a port, and I took a Windows workstation and very easily um, changed the NIC settings, the NIC properties, to use the MAC address of that Lexmark printer. Um, in this case, because it was a very simple test, that was the only change that I made. So as soon as the link state changed on that NIC, it tried to get an address. And in that case, Beacon saw that there was a, a change in the DHCP client vendor. Um, it changed to MSFT 5.0, indicating that's a Windows device, which essentially triggered the event that you see here on the bottom left. Um, and in this case, I had change of authorization set to reauth. That triggered us to communicate with the switch, and the switch tried to reauthorize that session. Since that device no longer resides in a trusted profile, the port stayed in an unauthorized state, and the device became isolated, therefore protecting the network. So again, we've got the real-time location, the event delivery methods, and the active response options. The last one is something that's been built into the, the latest release of the product, and it's something that's, that we're tracking automatically without, without any manual intervention. And it's this notion around duplicate MAC or, or unexpected location change. So this is another view of that same event viewer, but the two events in this, um, in this regard, each of these MAC addresses has moved unexpectedly. Um, so the first MAC, you see it was a duplicate MAC alert, um, and you can see the ports that it moved from. So in this case, it was a device that wasn't expected to move. It moved from uh, switch ending in IP address 200.7, on port 18 to port 7 and then again to 15. Um, because that MAC showed up in all those different places, you know, we've identified that as a potential problem and essentially alerted the, the Beacon Administrator. And again, that could be done just in the UI or sent to, you know, to any other external system via syslog or SNMP. And with that, I'll, uh, I guess I'll hand it back to John and, and answer any questions that you have. And, and I thank you very much for your time today. Okay, great. We did get a number of questions. Uh, just remind everybody, if you have ones you want to get in, uh, enter them in on the right-hand uh, question window on the control panel on your screen. Um, let's see, Ty, you, you sort of went through NAC being the uh, essentially detection, profiling, and, and then enforcement. Um, so I'm going to rephrase a couple questions here a little bit. On the on the profiling sides of things, are you using device behavior to, to profile, to declare it a certain type of device or manufacturer? What, do you, what are you using beyond um, MAC address ranges to, to do profiling? Uh, great question. It's a number of different um, attributes that are available. So um, Beacon has the ability to ingest um, hundreds of attributes from dozens of sources and bind all that data to an endpoint in, in what we call uh, our warehouse of context. So the, uh, the data sources that we can take in, we consider it very much an a la carte menu because, you know, quite frankly, not every network has all the same data available. So really what we do is we work with our customers or prospects to understand the environment, choose the data collection methods that we want to use to start, and then we can augment those later on down the road in future phases. Um, but it's definitely trying to find a combination of both identity and, and behavioral attributes. So the, the most common in regards to identity are things like you know, getting MAC vendor data is very easy, but it's also very fallible. It's very easy to, 
to essentially cheat the system and look like something else just based on that. So we're binding things like MAC address data. Um, we can bring in IP data if that's relevant in the environment. Um, DHCP data, you know, host name, client vendor, requested options, DNS data. Um, Active Directory is a very common one to understand things like, is it a member of my domain? That certainly uh, alludes to an increased level of trust. Um, and then there's things like NetFlow to understand the behavioral aspect of it. You know, what is this device talking to and what's talking to it and over what ports and protocols? So it, it's really a combination of, you know, of all of those and then some. Okay, on the enforcement side, I had a question basically saying we, we use NAC. Um, However, we have uh, a problem, for example, where a device was essentially blocked because it was compromised, but an IT admin determined it was critically needed, essentially overrode the block, put the compromised device on the network. So I'll turn that to a question. In you, you outlined a couple of enforcement techniques, but is there some way you can interface with things to do more granular enforcement where it's fully, it's not just fully trusted, totally untrusted, it's, okay, this, this device needs to be put in a limited access zone or always flow through uh, intrusion detection to determine if uh, it's, it's doing something dangerous because we're suspicious. What, how do you get the more granular enforcement? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. So it, it, it's going to depend on, the, on the, network, uh, the network fabric itself in a lot of ways. So we're able to provide the level of uh, the level of visibility, but if it requires a very different uh, flavor of you know, granular access or limited access, for that matter, it's going to depend on the, the the construct of the network itself. Um, we're able to um, we're able to work with NAC systems in two ways. The NAC system can can essentially provide all of the enforcement, but ask us questions. Um, essentially, uh, it can do an LDAP or LDAPs query of Beacon and says hey, do you know this device and what profile does it reside in? And then based on our response, there can be a number of different mappings in that NAC system that say, allow it with full access, allow it with limited access, or don't allow it at all. Um, the other way that we can play with NAC systems is we can essentially be the front end or the first stop in the, in the radius um, authentication request. And in that case, um, if it's a user-based authentication, we can proxy that off to the existing radius server for user access, or we can, uh, we can. But prior to that, we can do a device-level lookup and understand if it's a device that you know is in, a, is in an approved profile or not. Um, in either case, based on our response, the uh, the ne and the network fabric, we can do things like if we're the first layer in that in that communication path, we can return radius attributes that do a variety of things: assign VLANs, assign VRFs. Um, essentially, anything that you could do with the standard IETF, um, and even a lot of the vendor-specific attributes to find in the uh, to find in Radius. Okay, uh, here's a question I'll take. Questions basically: What about security recommendations for customers using cloud services? As Internet of Things extends beyond our own network onto cloud services, or, or it doesn't even involve our internal networks at all. A um, couple comments there. I mean, one is obviously I mentioned uh, getting security, getting involved in procurement. Um, it could be procurement of the devices, but also procurement decisions for using cloud services, infrastructure as a service in particular, um, and those questions about visibility and control being part of the procurement process. How does cloud service provider demonstrate that in their smart building facility housing their cloud services that uh, vendors that come in to manage HVAC systems don't have full visibility into the network via the, those HVAC systems and the like. Um, also, as you start thinking about lo logistics and other types of systems, uh, delivery type capabilities that are going to be procured based on using autonomous vehicles or other sort of Internet of Things, um, the security group has to play an active role in, in saying, here's the types of questions that need to be in RFIs and RFPs and evaluation criteria and the like to make sure we still have that visibility. One good thing to look at, by the way, the U.S. government FedRAMP cloud um, security program, cloud evaluation, cloud services evaluation program, um, has a lot of very good requirements for visibility and control and, in fact, maps to the critical security controls as part of what they use to certify cloud services vendors. Uh, let me get to a couple more directly to you, Ty. Um, here's one. You speak of real-time discovery. Does this include wireless devices that may 
enter into your office space or, you know, say something like a, a MiFi uh, unit is used and multiple devices can connect. How do you, how do you deal with things that are connecting uh, non-Wi-Fi non wireless, essentially? Uh, yeah, that, so that's certainly a little bit more challenging. If it's, um, we're, we're certainly not scanning the airwaves and looking for devices that are, uh, that are essentially communicating out there but not on the infrastructure. So our focus is very much, you know, things that are connected to, you know, to our environment or the customer's environment. So if it's a wireless device, you know, there are, there are ways, you know, we're actually pulling the, um, the Cisco WLCs and the Aruba uh, wireless controllers for, you know, very granular information about, you know, what's connected and where those devices are. But if it's something that's um, like a MiFi that's really not, that's not riding across the, uh, the enterprise framework at all, and it's really just in parallel. You know, that's not something that that we're that's not a space that we're playing in right now. Okay, here's a good question. At the advice of a consult security consultant, we've essentially removed SNMP from uh, our network or worked to keep it out. Will your platform work without SMP enabled in the network? Um, it, it certainly can. So I guess you know a, a follow-up question I would have is. Um, I, I guess I would want to know why the recommendation was made to disable it altogether. Because um, we, we use SNMP for a couple of different things. I talked about SNMP as a, uh, as a form of sending traps to a network management system that based on event-driven data. Um, we do leverage SNMP data for, um, for polling of the infrastructure. You know, switches and routers know things. They just don't know enough things. But it's foundational data that, that we typically use. Um, but we can we can pull those devices over secure SNMP version three. So I guess um, you know without it, we could still function. There would you know we would have to find other ways of um, of uh, getting that real time detection. But you know that's one of the reasons that we've got a variety of different uh, data collection methods. So it's something I would love to have an additional dialogue with if uh, you know, if whoever that is would like to uh, you know, maybe have a follow up discussion. One-on-one, uh, -on -one or with a member of our team, you know, you can reach out to us at info at greatbasesoftware.com. Okay, and I think the broader issue is uh, SNMP SNMP v3 can be deployed very securely. It's not it's not trivial, uh, but there were older in past years advice of how bad the SNMP protocol was, and there was a lot of older advice to just oh ban it, block it. Um, but the reality is it can be done together. There actually are a good good number of white papers in the SANS Research Library. Um, that you can see um, SANS instructors and students have written on how to do SNMP securely. Well, let's see, with that, we're just about at the end of our time. I wanted to give you guys a list of some URLs and resources. There's the archive for uh, webcasts um, and the SANS What Works program. We have a number of white papers out there um, that are sort of customer case studies of deploying processes and technology with measurable security results. The next SANS event that's related to this area will be the SANS SOC Summit coming up in June in the uh, Northern Virginia area. There's a URL for that. There's how to get more information from Great Bay Software. As I mentioned earlier, if you are listening to a recorded version of this or you just didn't get your question in on time here, you can send it to q at sans.org and we'll get the right person to get you an answer. There's my Twitter handle at the end. So with that, let me turn it over to Carol for any final words. All right, well, thank you so much, John and Ty, for your great presentation, and to Great Bay Software for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. <laughs>